Okay, we are going to draw photosynthesis. And because photosynthesis happens in such a small space, we're going to greatly exaggerate its size. So bear with me. We're first going to start by drawing a plant cell. And so remember, plant cells have cell membranes just like animal cells. So we'll draw a cell membrane. Um, and then inside of the plant cell, the functional organelle in this process is the chloroplast. Now a chloroplast is really big compared to what we're going to draw here, but the process is so tiny that I'm going to exaggerate what's inside. Um, a chloroplast is going to take up actually the entire board. Um, it has a double membrane just like the mitochondria. Okay, and this would be a double, a bilayer just like this, but I, I don't want to draw that all. And it has a second layer. Okay, so this would go all the way around into a big circle. Okay, so inside is the thylakoid, and it's actually quite small. There are a bunch of flattened sacs. I'm just going to draw one and really big so we can see the process. And I am going to draw it as a bilayer just so we can get the idea down. Okay, so here is a thylakoid. There would be a bunch of these flattened sacs stacked on top of each other inside of the chloroplast. Inside the thylakoid membrane, <clears throat> excuse me, there are these two giant embedded proteins. And think of them, this is a cross section. Think of them like a donut, a purple donut with a red center, almost like an olive with a pimento. Okay, and I've cut both of those in half. And then there's some small embedded proteins here. And then this is a protein we've actually seen before. This is ATP synthase, and it works exactly the same as it does in our bodies. How weird is that? So it's the exact same protein. Okay, so it's these two proteins where the action takes place. And so these guys are called photosystems. So I'm going to label them up at the top. So the first one is photosystem 2. And the second one is photosystem 1. Reason being is that the, this one was documented first, this one was documented second, this was a name first, name second. They actually happened in the opposite order, so it's just to make your lives hard. Kind of funny that way. Okay, so photosystem 2, photosystem 1. And so in the photosystem, this is where the pigment for photosynthesis um, is, and it's called chlorophyll. We've seen this Probably or you've heard of it before. My green marker's not going to survive. Let me grab a different one. So inside of here we have little chlorophyll molecules. Okay, so I'll label that little guy as a chlorophyll. Alright, and those are in both photosystems. They look exactly the same. And we have a bunch of them in these light harvesting complexes, the purple part. And then we have two very special ones right in the middle. Now they're not actually special. They look exactly the same as the other chlorophyll molecules. They're just in the right place, okay, in a very special place. We also have some accessory pigments. These are the pigments that are orange, like in carrots. Um, there's several different pigments, red peppers, that, have, um, that can also absorb light, just different colors of light. Okay, so... We also need our sunshine, so we'll put our sunshine, now obviously it wouldn't be inside the plant, but we're going to pretend this is outside the plant. This is our sunshine, it's shining. Okay, and so what we have is we have photon energy that's traveling from the sun and hitting these chlorophyll molecules. So these are photons. Okay, and the photons are hitting the chlorophyll molecules and the chlorophyll molecules are getting excited. It's what's going to excite their electrons, just like in the fluorescent star. However, one single chlorophyll can't gather enough energy to pop the electron out as high as we need it to be. And so the chlorophylls actually work together. So they start bouncing around all this energy inside of them from one chlorophyll to the next. Okay, so I'm just drawing little yellow lines and then they all pass their energy to the middle ones all at the same time. Okay, 
and this causes the two electrons on these middle guys to have enough energy to jump way out in their electron shell. So I'm just going to draw two little electrons. They're going to jump way high. Okay. So if we were to actually look inside and see what's happening right there, I'm going to draw it right here. Inside the chlorophyll molecule, we're taking an electron, or two electrons, and we're shooting them way out to there, okay, using photon energy to do so. Now, instead of letting them fall back down and glow, which they will, remember I told you, you can take these chlorophyll molecules and you can um, isolate them, shine sunlight on them, and then they glow back. Um, they, they glow in the dark. They actually glow red. It's pretty cool. Um, but we're not going to let them glow. We're going to capture them here, and then we're going to take them down one step at a time by passing them from protein to protein. We've seen this before, correct? It's called an electron transport chain. And they have one too, right there, just like ours. So I'm going to abbreviate it, ETC, electron transport chain. So these electrons, they simply get passed down the electron transport chain. Now what's happening as they fall, just like in our bodies, they're losing energy, and they're using that energy to do the exact same thing we do, to take protons and shuttle them inside. So this thylakoid space in here is just like the intermembrane space in a mitochondria. Okay, so they come in here, and obviously after lots of this has occurred, you're going to end up with a ton of excuse me, protons inside our thylakoid space, okay? And so as a consequence, where do they want to go? Well, they want to go out, and lo and behold, there's an ATP synthase sitting right there. So as they flow back out, this guy starts to spin again, and what do you think comes out? Ding, ding, ding. ATP. So ATP gets produced. Now this is not the ATP the plant is going to use to live. This is the ATP the plant is going to use to build glucose molecules with high energy electrons. All right, so going back to here, these electrons, instead of falling onto an oxygen like they do in our body, they go right back onto these two chlorophylls in the next photosystem, where the same process happens all over again. This might be a good place to pause and get caught up on your video or on your drawing. Okay, so the same process happens in photosystem one. So we have photons that are coming in, exciting these chlorophyll molecules. They're all bouncing that energy around. They all pass it to the middle, just like before. And boom, two electrons jump out again. Okay, and they get passed once again. But in this case, they're not actually going to get passed down an electron transport chain. They get stored. Now, how did we store electrons that are high energy in our bodies? Remember NADH? Plants do the same thing, but in this case, they store it on a molecule that's very similar. It just has an extra phosphate in it. So it's called NADPH. And I just think of the P as plants. It doesn't really stand for plants, it's a phosphate, but it helps me remember. Okay, so the electrons go on to this molecule where they're temporarily stored. So, to make a glucose molecule, what do we need? Let's just make a list over here. We would need the carbons, the oxygens, the hydrogens, okay? We would also need high energy electrons and we need some ATP to run the whole system. Okay, so we have successfully now, with this process, which we call the light reactions, so these are all the light reactions, all of this. Okay, those all happen with the sunlight, and we have successfully created ATP and high energy electrons. Now, we have one thing that's a problem. 
These electrons, they left these chlorophylls, they made their way down the electron transfer chain into the second photosystem, photosystem 1, up again and onto an NADPH. So if we want to run this process again, we've got to replace those electrons. So the plant actually uses, which we learned in your exploration activity, water. So the water will passively diffuse by osmosis into the cell. And the water gets taken right over here to photosystem 2. Let's draw it right here. H, and we'll draw it and remove this as this. So there's our H2O, okay? And we are going to simply do the exact opposite of what our bodies did. So you remember in our bodies at the bottom of the electron transfer chain, we take that oxygen, we add two electrons, it attracts two hydrogens and becomes water. In photosynthesis, we remove those two hydrogen ions and we take the electrons back. Okay, so the electrons out of each of these bonds end up replacing the electrons that left. That turns this oxygen, or this water, excuse me, into oxygen. And the oxygen will readily diffuse out. And I'll show you actually on the outside of the cell, and I can't really draw it here the way that this is drawn, but on the outside of the cell, we have a little breathing apparatus. I'm just going to draw it right here, pretend. Okay, it's called a stomata. And it opens and closes and allows the oxygen to be exhaled by the plant. Okay, and it's actually on the underside of a leaf. All right, so now we've finished our light reactions. Now we're ready to build a glucose molecule. And it happens in a very similar fashion to what happens in our body, just in reverse. So remember the citric acid cycle? Well, the plant has a cycle too. It's called the Calvin cycle, named after the guy who discovered it. Calvin cycle. And it's also a cycle because it starts and ends with the same product. And we're not going to worry about what that one is. But basically what happens is all the things needed to build a glucose have to go in. Okay, so in order to build the glucose, we're going to get the carbon and oxygen from the air in the form of carbon dioxide, which is exactly what we exhale. Well, the plant simply takes it back in. So we take CO2, and we're going to bring it back into the cycle. Now, there's a very specific enzyme that can do that. And it's one of the most, probably the most important enzyme on the planet. And its name is Rubisco. Rubisco is the enzyme that can pull inorganic carbon dioxide out of the air and put it into an organic molecule. <clears throat> it is the enzyme that's very, very old, evolutionarily, and it's the enzyme that turned all of the, um, the, the atmosphere that we had in the primitive Earth into a livable, habitable place for us by producing oxygen and, and uh, organic molecules. <clears throat> Excuse me. So, we've got our carbon and our oxygen, we need our high energy electrons. Well, where do we get them? We simply get them from the NADPH we made during the light reactions. Boom. And we need some ATP. Well, we can get that too from the light reactions. So the ATP that's produced also goes into the cycle. And the Calvin cycle actually turns once per carbon dioxide. So to make a glucose, it would have to turn six times. And the actual product of the Calvin cycle is a three carbon sugar, similar to pyruvate. And we call it G3P. Okay. And then outside of the chloroplast, we can simply do two times that and produce glucose. And that's what the plant does. And then it links them all together as starch and stores them in the plant. So this is kind of the equivalent of the reverse of glycolysis. This is the equivalent of the reverse of the um, citric acid cycle. And then this is the equivalent of the reverse of the electron transport chain. Now these reactions are often called the dark reactions. They don't have to be in the dark. They're just not light dependent. Okay, now you want to Stop this video and catch yourself up, or pause this video and catch yourself up.